Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, next event for becoming a faculty one-on-one -on -one uh, seminar series. And today we will touch base on the research and teaching at Liberal Arts College with a panel discussion, and we have wonderful panelists over here. And since, as you might aware of my uh, terrible voice, <laughs> I will hand it over the uh, hand the floor to Gabby, and then she will be uh, hosting and moderating the, the this event. And floor is yours, Gabby. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Gabby, and I'm a postdoc at SUNY Albany, and I'm I'm a SUNY representative at INET. And I just wanted to start um, the panel discussion. Before we go into me introducing the speakers, I just want you guys to introduce um, INET and what INET stands for. So INET was uh, INET NYC stands for International Networking and in New York City, founded in 2014. And it was primarily or initially founded to sort of facilitate um, um, and, uh, communication between the international students in New York City and provide a community support. So we, primarily focusing on a couple of different, putting up a couple of different events. So career development events, which one of them is uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, we also try to do networking at social events in New York City area, as well as we share research opportunities inside and outside of the US, as well as we provide some form of informational session. So in a couple of months ago, for example, we had an immigration webinar with a lawyer that discussed all the all types of visas available for scientists specifically. So um, INED consists mostly of uh, foreign scientists um, from different research institutions in New York, but uh, don't be alarmed because we're trying to expand our borders beyond New York City. I'm currently in upstate New York, but most of our members currently, we stand at about 900 of them are STEM scientists uh, from different universities in New York City, uh, Cold Spring Harbor, Rockefeller, NYU, you name it. Um, but we also include SUNY schools. So we have people at Yale, at Rutgers, even Cornell. So we would like to uh, encourage everyone to join INET. Uh, that way you can stay up to date of uh, on all of the events we um, put out every every couple of months. We have all kinds of social media, so LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. We have YouTube channel where we uh, post uh, videos from our webinars like this, so you can you watch them and um, get the information uh, you're interested in. We have our website, just Google INET NYC and all their information how to become a member is there, as well as you can email us at any time with any of the questions you have. Uh, most importantly, we are uh, really in desperate need of new board members. So becoming a board member of INET NYC uh, can be very beneficial to your resume. If you're looking to build up more of your soft skills or leadership skills, this is a perfect opportunity to do so. We are looking for a passionate STEM scientist, foreign STEM scientist who are passionate about science as well as improving or expanding their uh, networking across uh, international scientists in the New York City area, as well as outside of the city, as well as uh, who's interested in just putting together interesting, useful um, career type or professional development events. So if you're interested in uh, different roles that are available, please, not all of the roles are currently listed on the website, but please email us and we can send you um, more information about um, potential roles or just let us know what you're interested in and we can definitely uh, email you back with more information. So uh, as a brief, um, as we're coming to an end of the year, uh, we are sort of uh, put together a um, couple of future or finalizing events for the next year. Uh, we're definitely going to have another immigration event um, probably in the fall as well as um, in a collaboration with your access organization, uh, which helps um, sort of international um, STEM scientists collaborate between the US and Europe. So we'll have probably a webinar or some sort of activity um, that help uh, scientists from US to move to Europe, as well as we're probably gonna have another uh, type of panel discussion on, on different um, career um, or professional development event. And um, just to sort of end the presentation, I would like to thank our president, Aisha Gul, who's um, 
leading this or holding this organization together. Um, we also have Coralie and me who are part of the board um, are helping put together all these events and advertise, as well as Conchi, who's a previous president and is our um, consulting member. But we would um, like to admit more people to the board as we really need help putting these events together. So if you're interested, you know, again, email us and we're really happy to share any information available. And without any further ado, we will start our panel discussion. Uh, I will give a brief introduction uh, to all of the panelists. I'm very happy to say that we have uh, four professors at, uh, from different liberal, for, uh, three different liberal arts colleges. You'll hear me say SLAC sometimes. So SLAC stands for a small liberal arts college. Um, all of them cover three or four different STEM fields, which is amazing. Um, and I'll just exit the presentation so you guys can see their uh, faces. So I will start with Dr. Katie Berry. Um, Dr. Katie Berry is an associate professor of biochemistry at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. She currently teaches chemistry and biochemistry courses and runs a research lab investigating RNA protein interactions in E. coli as a model, model system. Uh, we next have Dr. Juan Merlo Ramirez, uh, who's an assistant uh, professor of physics at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And apart from teaching a bunch of physics courses, he's also a published author for uh, who publishes um, science books for kids. He's also running a lab that's focused on near-field microscopy, plas plasmonics, uh, topological phases of matter and classical systems. And next, we have Dr. Um, Lili, uh, Lilia Yatsunik, as, who is a professor and department chair of chemistry and biochemistry at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. And she's currently teaching many chemistry courses. And she's also running a very successful um, chemistry lab that focuses on understanding the structural diversity of a DNA. And last but not least, we, do, we have uh, Dr. Boyana Zupan, who is a uh, an associate professor of psychological science at also Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, she's teaching courses in the Neuroscience and Behavior Program and runs an active research lab investigating the impact of genetic and environmental factors on development and behavioral traits associated with disorders such as ADHD and autism. So this was a very brief one introduction to all our panelists. Uh, I have a, a questions ready to sort of leave, lead the panel discussion, but I would really like um, all the participants, if you please post all your questions in the Q&A section, and we'll try to incorporate your questions uh, to specific panelists or all of the panelists as much as we can. So don't be shy. Or you can raise your hand and ask live if you want to too. So maybe we can start the discussion with the basics. Um, how, what mo motivated all of you to join Slack or liberal arts colleges? Uh, I don't know, maybe someone wants to speak first. Uh, how about Dr. Katie Berry? Okay, sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, so um, as some of you might've heard as we we're coming in, like I went to one of these um, small liberal arts colleges. I went to Swarthmore and graduated from the department that Lilia now chairs. Um, and I think right from the get go, like I just, I loved that sort of, um, I don't know, that the, the, the close knit relationships that students have with professors and really the, 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 the value that was placed on undergraduates um, in that space. Um, and as I went through my PhD, I found that I enjoyed the research, but the part that I enjoyed the most is when I had younger students who were working with me and that we were um, working together towards a common goal because um, research fails all of the time. And that's a hard part of doing science, as I'm sure you guys all know. And for me, I found that when I was able to um, sort of 
mentor a younger student through the research process, it was really easy for me to sort of maintain a growth mindset and sort of see each failure as like a learning opportunity. Um, and, and actually the best ideas that I had as a graduate student and the projects that worked the best were when I was trying to design something that would work well with undergraduate hands. Um, so I always enjoyed teaching and knew I wanted to have a research lab, but I like the sort of challenge and the fun of coming up with research projects that have that added dimension of training undergraduate students. And that's, um, yeah, that's why it was the right, uh, the right sort of space for me. Lovely. Thank you. Um, anyone wants to, yeah, I, I can go next. Um, so when I was in postdoc, I was thinking more about R1 institutions. And in fact, when um, I was a postdoc, we had somebody who interviewed and I asked a person like, oh, what's your career goal? And he said, oh, I want to teach in a a primarily undergraduate institution. And I thought, oh my God, what a stupid idea. But three years later, when I was in the job market, I think that just sat in my head about just like the fact that they exist because I came from Ukraine. So I did not know the types of institutions, but of course being a postdoc, like you know about all other one institutions. Um, so, but when I was actually looking for a job, I was worried that in an R1 institution, the teaching would not be kind of as valued and I didn't want to teach just like to teach and focus on the research I wanted to do. Like I enjoy teaching a lot. Um, I didn't even think about the aspect that Katie described about like mentoring undergraduates. I get to learn that I love that uh, once I got the job here, but my, I really wanted a job where I had a good balance of teaching and research. And in spite of what uh, you may hear from different faculty, um, undergraduate institutions do run um, high quality research programs. So um, like you do get here very nice balance of like teaching and research, both of which are very meaningful. And I think in after fact, after I got the job, I kind of decided that this is a good balance for me and I chose to stay even times that I had opportunity to move somewhere else. Thank you. Juan, um, maybe you can go next. Yeah, sure. Uh... <clears throat> As well as, uh, as Lilia, I came for a postdoc from Mexico, and I, I don't have uh, degrees in the United States. So as such, I, I didn't know what the Slack was at that time. So, but I took the advice of my former uh, boss, and he said, you, you should be a really good fit in, in a small liberal arts college. And actually, when I saw this, this position at Vassar, I, I just asked him and he said, yeah, that, that's essentially what I was talking about. And then, yeah, uh, I've been teaching half of my life. So I started teaching in Mexico when I was like 20 years old or so. And, and I've taught from uh, elementary school to uh, grad, grad school students. So I, I really love to do that. And also, I, I really like to, to, to have a, a lab. So it's been a really rewarding experience to, to have that. And the fact that, for example, Vassar is a small liberal arts college. Uh, we have very small number of students. Uh, I really love that part because we have really uh, close relationships with our students. So I can really learn how students are uh, thinking of the things that we are uh, we are doing in in uh, in my lab, right? So that that's essentially my experience. And I'll just add in a little bit that um, so I actually was also a product of a liberal arts education. I went to Barnard College in New York, and um, but was very much sort of a, a um, sort of a, a, a science nerd, and I knew very much I was going to go to graduate school and did that. And I went to graduate school at a medical school. And so there were no undergraduate students, which meant that I sort of lost track that there is a teaching component to, uh, to being a PI. And um, so I, I don't know how many graduate students versus postdocs there are here, but um, you know, I was honestly burnt out by the time I defended my dissertation, the idea of going um um, jumping into a postdoc and sort of doing the rat race when I really didn't feel motivated, um, sort of was demoralizing. Um, and then I went and had lunch with my undergraduate advisor who said, by the way, we also do science. You did science as an undergrad, don't you remember? And sort of um, jolted my memory a little bit 
in that the reason why I selected my undergraduate institution was because they had a neuroscience major and because I got involved in research my freshman year. So as an 18 year old. Um, and so that again, seems silly in retrospect that I had sort of forgotten that path, but, you know, sort of having been reminded of it, I realized, oh, right. That sort of, that, um, sort of sense of academia, that sense of teaching and research, as well as collaboration across many different disciplines, because that's so often what happens within um, um, Slacks. Um, that was sort of more my ideal, my, my sort of goal in terms of professional development, rather than the sort of this, again, this R1 level rat race that I felt so exhausted by. And so once I decided to, to really sort of dig deep and, and I was re-energized, um, really the only thing that was on my radar was a uh, liberal arts um, institution. Um, the option of anything else was just off the table. And so in some ways, I am still in academia because there are liberal arts schools. Um, uh, yeah, th that was my path. I just realized because there's so many people might not be familiar with Slacks. Can one of you maybe define a bit what a Slack is and how is a bit different than, for example, R1, except for not having graduate students or just a regular um, undergrad only college? Anyone have a good definition? I, mean, I can I can take a stab at just the general idea. So liberal arts colleges, um, sort of the fundamental um, definition really deals with the approach to education and that it's. Um, sort of a well-rounded, um, sort of multidisciplinary, um, I don't want to say requirement, all schools are a little bit different, but there's an emphasis on, on harnessing not just a particular set of skills uh, or a particular type of professional degree, uh, but rather one where students are encouraged to think, to be challenged, to challenge others, and to really develop in terms of um, um, critical thinking and, and obviously there's pre-med programs, there's pre-law programs. Um, some liberal arts schools also have graduate programs in terms of masters, but it's more the, the, the sort of pedagogical theoretical approach to having a well-rounded education based on, on, on thinking and analysis rather than a skill set and a, and a profession. That's a great definition of like liberal arts, especially from like the student perspective. And maybe I can just sort of like add a framework sort of from like a faculty perspective, like, you know, you want to go into academia and like what type of different jobs are there? And I think it's like helpful to think about a whole spectrum um, of sort of teaching and research and the balance between them. Right. So at the sort of highest level are ones where people have um, multiple like R1 awards um, and grants like they might teach one course a year or part of a course a year, right? Um, at other sort of state, like state universities, you might have um, like a one-one uh, teaching load where you're teaching a course in each semester and have a very active research lab with an expectation of, you know, multiple papers a year, um, like big big, large grants. Um, and then at the other extreme, right, there are teaching positions that exclusively focus on teaching and you might teach a for four load, like four courses in each semester and have no research component at all. Um, and then you have um, liberal arts colleges that have like a small amount of research. So um, I'm thinking of a colleague at Emanuel College in Boston and um, he teaches um, a three, three. So three courses in the fall, three in the spring. And he does have a research lab, um, but the expectations for tenure um, are, are pretty small on the research side of things. Um, there's a sort of uh, expectation that you would apply for a grant, but not necessarily receive it. Um, and it's it's really more about the sort of process of providing research opportunities um, for, for, for students. Um, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but at Vassar and Swarthmore and Mount Holyoke, we're all sort of occupying a niche where um, the balance is shifted a little bit more towards research, um, where we might have a, a two, two teaching load, typically um, two courses in both semesters. And again, the research expectations are just 
between, right? So like at Mount Holyoke, I felt like I was expected to have a grant of some sort when I went up for tenure. Um, There's an expectation of, of some papers. And, and but, but I also got a much larger startup grant uh, award than I would have, you know, at a college that had a 3-3 teaching load, um, obviously smaller than a college a university with a 1-1 teaching load. So there's really just this whole range. And I think the question to sort of think about is, yeah, how, what type of teaching and what type of research do you value? Where do you, like, all of these jobs are fun and they're all exhausting and hard work. Um, and it's just a matter of sort of where you want to put that energy and then sort of choosing a university that's going to have that right balance of teaching and resources and the resources, but then also the expectations that, that come along with sort of all of those permutations. Anyone have anything to add? Anything to add? Maybe I'll just add one thing, because I'm not sure that I realized this when I was younger, but I say I was expected to have a grant, but um, there are both at NSF and at NIH specific grant like um, programs that are for primarily undergraduate institutions or, or SLACs. So um, I've applied for and gotten an R15 award um, from the NIH. Um, and, and so the expectations are not what an R1 would have, and there's really a value in um, in, un in the undergraduate training component. So the great thing um, about working at one of these in the U.S. is that our major funding institutions sort of do value this work of training the next generation, and so there are grant opportunities that are specifically geared for these types of projects. And I'll just say that, like at general medicine, the R15 funding rates, like knock on wood, because who knows what's about to happen next year, but but they've been really good for the last five years, like above 30% um, successful funding for R15s at General Medicine. Um, so there really is support and investment that makes it sort of possible to live up to the, the, the expectations from the institutions. Yeah, I would like to add that uh, meet, I met um, Dr. Berry at a conference where she brought her undergrad students and they were all they were all excellent. They were presenting posters. They were well-rounded individuals in science and they were well-prepared. I assume people maybe trained Slack students too in their lab and they were always excellent. So I was very surprised that arts colleges would produce STEM-prepared um, students. It's very exciting. Um, maybe we can uh, move on to more of like the hiring process at Slack. So, um, if one of your colleges, I don't know if it's more universal, universal across all of them, but um, do they specifically put out uh, professorship positions um, that are require you to have a um, certain amount of research and certain amount of teaching or just teaching, or can you negotiate any of that or how does that work? I think I can try to answer. Um... Did your question imply that um, you can negotiate the amount of teaching and research you do, or you yeah. how much? Well, once you start, I guess. Um, no, it's when you interview. Um, typically, that's where you can see the options that available. But the college, it's a college-wide policy, so it's work two and two, two plus two. So you cannot. That is not negotiable. More or less, we have a, a course release for the new hires, which is during one year you have less teaching to do but the teaching load is decided by the whole entire university so it's very difficult uh you can negotiate if you have some huge grant or if you can hire like a teaching postdoc or something but that's like on individual basis so the teaching loads are defined and then the research expectations are also relatively defined um take into account of course what kind of science you do because the expectations like number of papers or number of grants or types of grants are different when you do you know organic chemistry versus biochemistry versus biology um and that is more um you can you can get feel for that just for looking like you know how much people publish what kind of work they do how many students they engage in their labs but it's 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 a discipline specific more than a school specific and the expectations for tenure uh that's why it will come to play they usually never very explicitly described um, so you, nobody will tell you, uh, I mean, in most places, nobody will tell you, like you expected to write three papers, 
but you can kind of see your colleagues. Um, and again, like it's different, like it, the expectations are high and higher in terms of research productivity. Um, and I feel like we're an exponential kind of part of the curve. Uh, so something that was expected of me uh, 15 years ago is different from what is expected from the person who we hired this year. And then I can also add in terms of what the searches look like, they work on the same cycle as, as our one institutions generally do, although they may be a bit more stochastic. Um, ours is very much um, tied to the academic year. And so typically tenure track positions, um, uh, openings are um, advertised in the early fall, late summer, early fall. Now is the time that um, uh, phoner or now Zoom slash on-campus interviews are being held and individuals are typically informed um, at some point in the early new year. Um, for, um, and so what um, Lilia was talking about is very accurate in that the job descriptions very explicitly state what the teaching requirements are and what research areas typically are desired. A lot of the time, those have to do with what courses need to be covered and what sort of areas of expertise in the curriculum are needed um, in the candidate. However, the details of what individual candidates might bring in terms of the specific area of research are uh, often uh, open-ended because, um, again, it, it depends. There's rarely multiple faculty doing very similar work at a Slack. So at an R1, you might have um, a neuroscience program with 50 participating faculty of whom uh, eight of them work on some sort of, uh, uh, you know, genetic risk factors associated with some mental conditions. Um, you know, uh, at, at a liberal arts school, there might be one person, right, doing that type of work. And so, again, um, the, the searches are a little bit broader in the, I would say, in the scientific realm. And so there's some, um, I think, malleability. Uh, on the other hand, they're very, very narrow and very specific in terms of the pedagogical teaching requirements because every department needs to fill their curricular needs. Uh, anyone else has anything to add? I have a question from the audience couple, actually. Um, do you find that there are expectations that uh, new hires for the tenure track positions apply with a grant in hand? Everyone's <laughs> shaking their heads. No, I don't think, I, 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 I'm not actually sure that you'd be allowed to take a K-99 to a small liberal arts college. I've sort of thought about that and like, is there a way to like get that money and change your mind? But um, there's certainly, I'm not sure that it would even be allowed. And I've never heard anybody in any context um, uh, talk about what the expectation to have a grant. It would be at, at, at a school with the resources and teaching load of Vassar and Swarthmore. I mean, you guys at Vassar, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But they're, they're or it's worth more. There might be an expectation in certain disciplines of having a grant before you go up for tenure, but you would have startup funds to get your project off the ground. And, you know, like I submitted my first grant in my third year, right? Because it took some time. I wanted to have preliminary results that I could show. These were collected by Mount Holyoke students, like in my lab, like this is feasible, this can work. Um, so there's no expectation to have that in place. I do have a, um, um, a mention of a, um, a colleague, not at Vassar, but at a different institution who at the time of her transition to a tenure track position was a co-PI on a, on a grant. And that was through some rearrangement of, of some person hours and other requirements she was able to actually take um, take with, but there's no expectation on part of the administrations um, that that a faculty incoming faculty member brings already uh, research funding. But just like you would for an R one, part of the job propose a part of the job application is a research proposal um, where you would be laying out the ideas that you would have, and it might map a little bit to give a sense of what your grant would look like. So you're able to demonstrate the sort of 
um, the cohesiveness of your ideas and sort of demonstrate that you have an idea for a cohesive research program and make a pitch. And this is really important, maybe the most important thing, but make the pitch that, um, that this is feasible with undergraduate students. Um, and um, I had a friend when I was applying who was a couple of years ahead of me and had started a job. And he said when he opened up um, applications, the first thing he did was find and page on the research proposal for undergraduate. And I, I'm sure that that's like one specific person. But the idea was like um, you really want to be bringing in explicitly that idea to show that you've thought about how this will work in an undergraduate context with the sort of funding that's available with the time that students have. So how does this break into small individual projects? Can this be done, you know, five to 10 hours a week Would this, what parts of the project would get done during 10 week intervals in the summer? Um, and so if you haven't spent time like at a small liberal arts college, you know, follow up with somebody informational interview or maybe you can go and give a talk there and sort of visit to just get a sense for really what's um, possible because the more you can incorporate that um, not just into your interview but into your proposal itself and and that's also a part of my NIH grant proposals right is explicitly addressing the way that it's um, feasible at my institution that'll really help um, and I'll just say that because that's an important part of it the research proposals at um and these slacks tend to be a little bit longer than what an R1 research proposal might be. So I think, I don't know, m most of mine were like five to six pages when I was applying. And that really gives you space to talk about both the research ideas, but also how you will uh, feasibly incorporate students. Awesome. Um, thank you. Um, so as far as, so can you clarify our the grants are not important for when you apply for a position, but are they encouraged or expected for your tenure process or that differs between schools? I think nobody puts clear, I mean, people put clear tenure expectation that have a lot of room for interpretation. Um, we had this successful case where the faculty had like amazing number of publications, was excellent teacher, but like didn't have any grants and then didn't and didn't go against the person. So um, that's why I think they want to keep their tenure expectation kind of undefined in terms of number of things. Um, and even if there is an expectation of a grant, it's possible like you have grants right now in the review or it's possible your program finally got to the point because sometimes it takes five years to get the program to the good point and Tenure review starts at the end of your fifth year. So basically, whatever you can get done um, in five years, that's what you're going to put on the plate. Um, and if you demonstrate that, you know, by this point, you got like three or four publications and you're applying for grant and, you know, maybe include grant proposal, or include reviews that you receive saying like, oh, everything is excellent. This thing's one needs to be improved and it may be funded. That could count as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if there are anybody has this like explicit um, number of grants or a grant to have. Yeah, and one can maybe also double up on on, on this in terms of a different department of Vassar, but uh, for Vassar, um, at least in uh, sort of my side of the science quad, um, it was explicitly stated that external grants are not expected. Um, and it now that's sort of the official perspective, but it really depends on the type of work that you do. And so even though Vassar has a quite a few sort of internal pots of money and um, faculty research funds, um, and so there's an expectation of productivity, the type of work that I do could not be productive with internal funding. And so I understood it in my own mind that even though the administration didn't require external grants, that if I met, needed to meet this sort of more ambiguous uh, expectation of productivity, that I would need to get external funding. Um, but wanted to know if there was a different sense um, in physics. No, actually, it's quite the same. However, we have to understand, for example, my example, uh, for my case, uh, the uh, startup budget that I got was enough to build up the, the things that I, I have to do for my research. And also the internal funding was a part of that. However, for example, uh, Brian Daly, that is a professor also in physics, his, uh, let's say, research setup is 
or, or was way larger in terms of money than the startup. So he, if he wanted to keep working in that line, he had to get some external funding and that's essentially what he did, right? So yeah, but it's not as expected uh, at this stage in the physics department as well. Thank you. Um, so we have actually a couple of multi-part questions. Um, can you describe what types of things will help you, help you to obtain one of these slack positions? For instance, is a postdoc favor, favorable or unfavorable? Or is there a certain level of teaching hours many colleges like to see and do publications matter? Um, I can start. So, um, so yes, um, postdoc is, I mean, I don't wanna say we exclude people from um, being successful applicants if they don't have a postdoc, so it's not required, but um, basically once we're down to the 10 people, all of them have a postdoc experience. And that's typically postdoc experience with the 100% research component. So not like half teaching, half, half. We, don't, we, did, we actually don't have many applicants who have this like teaching postdocs. Um, maybe they could be successful, but majority of people we get have like a strong postdoc experience because publications do matter. We do look at the research productivity um, as well as like, you know, whether it's a first author, second author, last author uh, papers. Um, we do look at the demonstrated uh, experience in teaching and for some people who came from like R1 schools with a postdoc in R1 school sometimes they um, they don't have much to show there but I think these days it seems like everybody participates in some sort of teaching uh, workshops um, most of our applicants have that um, and yes and I think what what Katie said we really want to see that the research proposals uh, are described such that they are feasible with undergraduates and that they, how they will in, engage undergraduates or if you need some super expensive instrumentation, where you're gonna get it, um, you know, like in, we, are, we are like 20 minutes away from Penn. So, you know, it's perfectly fine to say we can collaborate with Penn, especially if you have already a collaboration, but like if you need cryo and microscope, we cannot buy you no matter what kind of startup we can provide. So yeah, that's my experience in hiring. Yeah, I um, can add on that I agree that a research-based postdoc is probably the best, best path um, to take, um, especially maybe less so for a college that was more on the teaching side of the spectrum, um, but for this sort of flavor of, of Slack that really values um, research, active research programs with undergraduates. Um, and and the, the way that I think about it is that sort of what Lilia said earlier, where, or maybe it was Hannah, where when you become, when you go to your department, right? I'm in a chemistry department, right? Like I'm the only one who specializes in my area of, of chemistry and biology, right? And so I have colleagues that do all sorts of different things. None of them are going to be much help for me getting my research program off the ground. So coming in with like a really strong understanding of what my research is going to be, where I can really like I, I'm ready to roll on that. Right. And um, on the flip side, all of my colleagues are super experienced and passionate teachers, right? And they can help me learn how to be a good teacher. I can lean on them in my first year or two as I get off the ground. So the way I think about it is that you want to be able to show, you know, excellence, like demonstrated excellence in research and that ability to have ideas that will work with undergraduates. And you want to be able to show like interest in teaching and like a, a, a sort of a commitment that, 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 that it's something you've thought about before, that you've made some effort, um, you know, but it doesn't have to be teaching a whole class. It does not have to be um, doing a sabbatical replacement, right? It, it could be a workshop like Lilia mentioned or guest teaching a lecture or two, or maybe it's TAing, but you wanna be able to show that you've thought about teaching before and it's something you're interested in. But I feel like, um, 
yeah, I certainly didn't have any experience teaching an independent course before my first semester at Mount Holyoke. And the way that I think about it is that because everybody there is really committed to teaching, we can sort of, you know, get up that learning curve together, but you're not going to have any support really at the institution for your research. And so it's important to sort of have that like clear in your own head. Anyone else would like to pit in? Juan, did you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, yeah, I thank you, Bunyan. Uh Essentially, uh, I served in a, a tenure track faculty uh, committee. Uh, and it's important what, what Lilia said about publications. That's really important because essentially, uh, just following with what Katie mentioned, in these uh, slacks, what you will find is that you will be kind of isolated up to a certain point in your research. So if you don't have any publication at the time that you get this position, uh, we hire you, it would be uh, actually, we will be uh, harming you because essentially you will, you will have to learn how to write papers and also learn how to teach. So that should be really harmful for, for a candidate or somebody coming to, to a Slack. So that's, that's why uh, it, it would be really important that you focused on essentially a research in which you can publish something before coming into a Slack. And I just wanted to add, though, I think there may be some variability on that in, in terms of the teaching component. So I, I, I definitely second and third this, the, the sentiment that research has to be solid. Um, if, if you're not coming in with a record um, of, you know, of publication and uh, the ability to communicate your own independent research program within the context of a, of a liberal arts uh, sort of uh, institution, then that's a non-starter. However, um, it's when searches happen, it's not just about how good of a candidate you are. It's about what the candidate pool looks like for the search committee. And so I think candidates um, who have limited exposure to teaching uh, that even somewhat slightly resembles what the institution is looking for um, may be at a disadvantage. And so I would say that if you find yourself you know, drawn towards mentorship teaching, even if it's mentoring undergraduates in your lab, if it's tutoring high school students, uh, uh, participating as a mentor in uh, science fairs or anything of that sort that can first be informative to you as to whether or not you enjoy these interactions and show a continuous record of um, attempting to engage in these types of mentorship and teaching um, opportunities. I think that counts for a lot, even if you may not have developed an entire course and taught it during a semester as a as an adjunct professor somewhere, right? But having nothing other than TA'd, um, you know, TA'd a 150 person introductory biology course when you were a graduate student, um, sure, that's something, but you have to think about all the other candidates that you're competing against that is not a very, you know, that's a very low bar of teaching experience if that's the only thing you have. Yeah, I think I'm going to add. Go ahead. I'm going to add quickly. Um, I think I totally agree with Bojana. And I mean, the easy way to get teaching experience, if um, like if you like, like you said, you can learn about yourself, whether you actually that's what you want to do. It's like there are community colleges, you can teach a course there, just try it out. I think that should not be extremely difficult, but it also will look very good that you really try to get teaching experience. But of course, it's like developing courses, a lot of work. The other thing I wanted to say, if any of you currently, like what I found very difficult when I started the job is how much work it is, how much more work it is than I thought it is to write the paper independently. Because I felt like I wrote all my papers on my own, which I kind of did all the writing, but my professor, she handled all the communicated with the journal, like deciding how to respond to reviews. So Currently, if you're working on any of the papers, tell your professor that you want to participate as much as possible in the writing process. Tell her to like, or him to include you when she communicates, like when she writes a cover letter to the journal, or maybe tell her that you want to write it when 
uh, you get response from a journal, tell her, let me uh, look at uh, what they ask us and let me propose how I'm going to work on it. Let me write this response letter. Like try to participate in every step because you'll be a lot more prepared. Writing paper is a lot more than just putting the text on the page. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is when you apply for majority of jobs, you need to write more than one research proposal. And I remember when I was putting them together, I was I was very, very stressed whether my ideas are good, whether this is going to work. How can I come up with three proposals? In some sense, um, the research proposals you put on a plate, in addition to doing something you want to do, it's also just um, your ability to convey cohesive idea to the scientific audience. So don't feel like you're totally attached to needed to do this once you come. Like I had three proposals um, and I only work on one of them. And that was the one I was 100% planning not to work at all. It was kind of off the wall thing. I just put on the page and this is like the, the research now that I absolutely love. So don't be like too scared like and feeling like whatever you write today for your proposal, you have to do it for the next 30 years. Just treat it as like practicing, writing, thinking about ideas, putting them on the page, making sure they're cohesive, making sure that they're doable, just from kind of more theoretical point of view. Sorry. Yeah. Katie. Oh, no, I was just going to say, as I agree in general with the um, statement that publications are important. But I also just want to say that... Um, that like, right, even if you don't feel like you're totally ready or that things are exactly where you want them to be, like it's okay to apply and there aren't hard and fast rules. So I had publications from my PhD, but when I applied for Slack jobs, I was um, four or so years into a postdoc and I didn't have any publications. Um, and the only reason I applied the year that I applied is because my alma mater was searching uh, for someone. And I thought I have to throw my hat in the ring for this one. So I'll apply to a few more too. So I really, I went out earlier than I could have possibly expected it to go well. And I was shocked <laughs> that I got interviews and ultimately offers. And I think, um, yeah, like I, I had I had data that was moving along. I had my PI who could talk about the progress I was making. Um, and I think that the proposal itself, right, was an opportunity to show my ability to write uh, clearly and, and that I had good ideas for what I would do with undergraduates. And I kept saying like, aren't you worried that I don't have a paper? Like, shouldn't you be worried that I don't have a paper yet? Um, and ultimately I was able to negotiate to um, defer a position for a year so that I had time to like write a paper so that I wasn't coming in sort of at a disadvantage. And that ended up working well. Um, and I sort of got lucky that it all worked out. But I just want to say, if you're like, I don't have the papers yet, right? They want to see multiple, like, like, everybody's package is going to look a little bit different and there's no one perfect combination of things. And I would have thought that was a huge liability when I was applying and like I got multiple great offers and it worked out just fine. Right. So don't count yourself out. If you take yourself out, then you, you know, you're not giving anybody else the opportunity to say, actually, we think you'd be great here. That's more encouraging, I guess. <laughs> And following up on the postdoc, there's a question uh, from the audience. Uh, could you offer advice on effectively planning a postdoc while currently engaging in teaching? Uh, additionally, are there any recommended programs you could suggest for this dual pursuit? Anyone took any specific teaching courses or programs during their PhD or um, postdoc, maybe? Um, I feel this is the um, like more modern trends. I think <laughs> when we were postdocs and there wasn't all this, like uh, there was not as many. There were actually, you should like your school, especially if you're the biggest school, probably has a teaching and learning center or center for diversity and inclusion. And I think there are, you can just look for those. Like, I don't think there are any like kind of things that every single school offer, but they're all kind of the same flavor. I know there is like a, maybe through educational department, there are some like observational teaching you can do. Um, 
summer school is a great place also to like see if you can um, teach like because it's usually short it's very intense but it's only like six weeks or 12 weeks or something like that yeah I was just gonna say that, that I don't think there was anything um, teaching related um, at my graduate program because there weren't any undergraduates there um, but I have heard from some uh, of my own undergraduates who are now in graduate school that there are seemingly some tracks um, so the person I'm thinking of is at Michigan um, and she is very much interested in a Slack sort of focused career trajectory. And apparently, uh, at least at Michigan, they do offer um, additional sort of pedagogy training and, and types courses that graduate students can take to, in addition to those required for their degrees um, to basically prepare them for that, um, that uh, career track. Uh, but I think that just depends on the institution. I also, well, as I said before, uh, I studied uh, physics in Mexico, and it's totally different from the United States, because in Mexico, I studied five years of physics instead of four years college or whatever, but 10 units. And I had a essentially a course on physics education. And I remember at that time that I was like, oh, who wants to learn how to teach you physics, right? But it happens that I learned a lot there, right? But it wasn't like a formal training. It was a course, uh, somehow formal training. But uh, my, my point is that essentially uh, it, 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 it was really, in my case, necessary to have that, tr that kind of learning. Because even though by the time I took this course, I had like five years of experience teaching, Still, I was missing the part, like the formal part of the, the teaching of physics. That is essentially something that I've seen more recently, like a trend in, 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 in programs, right? Training programs. Yeah, I just saw in the comment section, Melanie posted that there's an NIH IRA CDA uh, postdoctoral program in biomedical sciences. So maybe people can check that out. Yeah, I've heard good things and known people who have really enjoyed those programs. Yeah. Awesome. So there's a opportunity for you. So we still have eight minutes, so I'll do maybe one or two more questions. Um, so um, are you able to collaborate with other faculty members and other R1 institutions? I can jump on that. Uh, collaboration is extremely important. People mentioned multiple times being isolated. So without collaboration, you really cannot do as much as you can as you would otherwise. However, in the first five years, you have to prove that your research is your intellectual kind of um, uh, like it's yours intellectually. So if you are collaborating, be very mindful not to be like technician for another lab, but actually have intellectual input in the work. So it's best to collaborate. Like I collaborate with biologists because I don't know any biology, but the biologists I collaborate with, they don't know uh, much chemistry or biochemistry. So we like a perfect match. So that's how you want to build a so collaboration. Extremely important, but you have to be very careful, especially in the first five years. Don't say yes to everything. Make sure you think about it. Um, the best collaborations are usually the one that's like the closer you can actually see person in person. Um, those all work very well. Don't forget about your own school. So like it's worth more for my case, the biology people, physics people, um, math people, like they are good sources of kind of collaborative work. And that's actually very nice because you're right there. You can have coffee every week and discuss the progress of the project. The other great collaboration, like in my case, will be Penn, um, Temple, Jefferson, like all schools that I can get to and bring my students within 20 minutes. It's not to say don't have collaboration that are, you know, overseas or in a different state. It still works well, but it's just a little bit um, in collaboration. You have to make sure it's either like you pull everything and people just kind of write on your back. You write on somebody's back or what you really want is where both sides contribute and are curious and produce data and kind of things move forward. So, um, so yeah, collaboration is almost like finding a partner. It's except it's a scientific partner. Like it's to find a good one is, is, um, it's chance and hard work basically, but it's very, very, very rewarding and gives your students. So if you're in a, um, at a 
Slack and you don't have like fancy equipment. So collaboration is the other way. I bring my students to like somebody's lab and we can, you know, see cryo AM microscope and run experiments and stuff like that. So that's that gives exposure to your students um, to techniques you don't have at your own institution. That's good to hear that you can bring just people over where you have better equipment, but still keep your research program going with the collaborations. Um, anyone else has any suggestions? Still have, um, someone said something. Oh. oh, I mean, I just, I totally endorse everything um, Lilia said and just like that I've found um, collaborations like at this stage sort of, you know, um, sort of especially post tenure, right? Once I've demonstrated like this is my intellectual home and and contributions, um, like finding people who could benefit from from that. It, it's just it's been it's been really fun. And I was laughing because I um like I I went to um the RNA Society meeting when it was in Poland specifically because I there is a Polish scientist that I was really hoping <laughs> to collaborate with. And I was just like looking for him at coffee breaks and it, it felt a little bit like, you know, trying to um, pick somebody up at a bar or something. Right. Um, but it, it has been really, really, really fun. And in my case, it's more like um, I'm interested in questions that would typically be answered with, um, you know, in vitro biochemistry. That's really hard to do with undergraduates. So I have this clever genetic method, um, but his lab is doing that biochemistry. So it's actually been very fun to be able to bounce ideas back and forth with each other. And yeah, very much a fun part of the job. So thank you. Um, so for the last four minutes that we have, maybe you can um, give us some tips on how to run an effective undergrad only lab and what are the things to consider compared to regular grad student led labs? Uh, can I start? Yes, yes, <laughs> really quick. Uh, well, if you are coming from a postdoc, and you think that this, the pace of your lab is going to be the same as the one that you have, forget it. It's not going to happen, okay? And then there is some other component that is very important and is essentially what we call the continuity of the students. Essentially, that means that, for example, you train one student one semester, and it could be that that student doesn't like what you're doing, and then that person leaves your lab and you me and you lose all that training of one semester one year and then you have to find another person to to learn one more time and then do the things that the previous person was doing so that's that's something that you have to understand uh, that will happen in in an only undergrad uh, college and more important than that is that because of this lower pace then we have like longer times for tenure review. But when you look back, essentially, you will see that that time is uh, almost enough to, to get into the position in which you can get a successful tenure review. Uh, in my case, I'm in my fifth year and I can't even believe it, right, that I'm in my fifth year. So time goes really fast and because of this space, it's going to take longer time for for the things to to start like uh, leaving the ground. Thank you. I would just add, um, you can plan carefully. Um, so one nice thing about working with undergraduates is that they will do things as you show it to them, uh, because they have no bad habits. They have no habits. And so that's a really nice thing. On the other hand, it depends. They're all different. Some are some have good hands, right? And others don't. And it really requires you to be a very vigilant, um, uh, vigilant uh, uh, sort of mentor, but also a very good observer of of how they're responding, how they're doing, and how they're giving you the feedback. Are they engaged? Do they care? Are they sloppy? Um, and you know, it behooves you to sort of pick up on who's doing what type of work uh, and, and doing it well and is genuinely sort of personally invested in that research. Um, and in terms of planning, I would say once you have students doing certain things that you have trained and you are satisfied that they're doing them to your liking, um, you have to make sure that you set your expectations with the students. So mine is that I will not allow people in the lab who cannot commit less than a year. Uh, and typically students stay for at least two years. I've had multiple students stay three or even four years. 
Um, and that's wonderful because by the time they're seniors, they're working at the level of a graduate, early year graduate student. Sorry, graduate students, but it's true. Um, and the the nice thing is, I if there are projects that are ongoing and there or at least there are skill sets that have to be transferred over, I will have students work in pairs where trained older students work with junior members in the lab. And of course, always never get um, never get lazy. Uh, you have to check their 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 technique. You have to check their understanding because they are very eager. A lot of times, especially at Slack schools, these are selective uh, liberal arts colleges. Students, they're highly motivated. They're a selective, a sort of self-selected group. But that also means that sometimes they're not very good at admitting that they can't do something or that they don't know how to do something. And it is ultimately you as the PI who holds the reins and the responsibilities ultimately of the data that you publish. And so you want to make sure that they are actually doing things to to, again, to your standards. But as long as you can manage that, I think it's extremely rewarding and ultimately can be quite productive if you have a, a well-oiled machine, uh, particularly in the years when you get you know four or five seniors all at once. It's, it's quite astounding how much work they can actually do. I think I'll quickly add, um, undergraduate students are very excited about everything. So it's very easy to get students in your lab, unlike graduate students. They, uh, undergraduate students, they want to do everything. Uh, one of mine ruined his crystals and I was so sad. He's like, Lilia, don't worry, I'll grow new ones tomorrow. And he came and set everything up. There's they like they just want to do things. So that's very rewarding to do that, to like see that. And the other thing is that they are also very cheap. So even if you have to pay some stipends, that's a, it's nothing compared to what people have to pay um graduate students. So basically, if you do want to run research lab, you will always have students in it. And if you cannot pay, they can, you know, work for credit and such. So that in that aspect, you don't have to worry as much as if you go into R01 school. Yeah, those are great tips. Thank you so much. So since it's 5 p.m., we we're coming to an end to our session. And I would like to thank all the participants who joined us today. Hopefully you learned a lot and we convince you that Slacks are amazing if you're looking for a research and teaching experience or a career. Someone's clapping. Awesome. Um, we'll post this uh, recording on our YouTube channel maybe in a week or so. And most of all, on behalf of INET, I would really like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us and taking your time to educate us on Slack. So I feel like we don't really get that much information on what it's like to do research and teaching or Slacks in general. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, so I apologize for my uh, getting sick. And it was wonderful having all those great tips. And there's more opportunity, which we learned today again. So that thank, thank you again for joining. And also thanks for participating. And thanks, Gabby, for hosting events. And and hope to see you all for our next event. <laughs> awesome. Um, Someone said, uh, or Dr. Zapan said, yeah, feel free to email her if you have any questions. If you like to network or informational interviews, you can contact the panelists. I'm sure they're happy to talk to you. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Everyone enjoy your holidays. And see you next year. Bye. Thanks so much. Everyone. Bye.